Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to have a uh, friend of Access Chat here today, uh, long-term contributor Magnus Hegemar. Uh Delighted to have you here, Magnus. Um, first came across you through another chat, which was Neurodiverse STEM, and managed to steal you and your brain. Sure did. So, um, you know, uh, coming straight at us from your Imaginarium, where ideas are swimming around, and uh, you can enjoy the the joys of imbibing tobacco through an old proper pipe. I'm quite jealous as an ex-smoker. It's uh, <laughs> I'm sitting here enjoying your tobacco vicariously. Um, so um, thank you for that. I'm really... Um, yeah, I'm that's really, a kind of special effect on a video. Yeah, <laughs> put on your 3D glasses now. Yeah. I've got some. Um, they never get used. They're sat <laughs> underneath my 3D TV, which I always watch in 2D because <laughs> the 3D gives me a headache. But uh, yeah, I'll dig them out. Uh, so tell us a bit about yourself and what you, you, you're you doing. I know you're, you you have a number of interests. You're, you're very diverse interests. Obviously, you, you talk about neurodiversity, but you work in the software industry, um, but also you do all of these amazing um, fine art projects as well. So let, let's start off with a bit about you, and then we'll dive into the various different areas of your um, creative and professional life. Okay. So th thanks for ha having me. It's a real honor to be here on Access Chat. Um, I am a middle-aged man, married. Yes, autistic kids do grow up, and some of us do find romance and get married. I, I married my high school sweetheart, uh, Claire, and we have three lovely daughters together. Uh, two of my kids are neurotypical, and, and one is autistic. And it's actually through the diagnosis of our autistic daughter that I myself was diagnosed. Otherwise, uh, I, I flew under the radar most of my life with uh, mental health care pro professionals telling me they knew something was off, but they couldn't put their finger on it. Uh -huh. And it was only when having uh, the professional screeners in our home and in our lives evaluating our daughter that they started observing me and asking me questions. And uh, so, so that really... I think was a life changer. I think I, I, I would like to say if there are any adults out there that know they're a little different, that uh, are perhaps uh, around my age, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in my forties. When we were kids, they did not understand autism as a spectrum disorder and uh, they were not able to, to properly diagnose us. They, they can now, they can today. So if you suspect Go out and get screened. It, it, it was a real life changer for me. But through that, I started intentionally um, living life as an adventure every day, you might say. And I, I don't use that word lightly. Before my diagnosis, I was very um, rigid in my lifestyle. I would eat at the same restaurant every day, have the same meal at the same restaurant, in the same chair every day. Uh, I was not able or interested in maintaining friendships. And it was, it was a very lonely, solitary life. Coming out of the diagnosis, I, I spent some time gaining a better understanding of myself and my perspective of other people and their perspective of me. And I, I went on this mission, you might say, to better understand the people around me, uh, to, to kind of learn the social skills that I wasn't born with. And, oh, the adventures that took me on. I mean, I, I became a bouncer at a rowdy nightclub. Uh, I, <laughs> I actually joined a traditional motorcycle club. <laughs> um, it wasn't quite Sons of Anarchy. We weren't selling guns and, or, and heroin, but uh, we did party with the Hells Angels sometimes. Um, Something we have in common. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that really stuck was uh, I found a creative outlet through photography. People seem to really like the photographs I was taking of them. And even though you can't swing a stick in my town without hitting three or four other photographers, uh, something about 
my work was different, and I, I'm not going to say that I'm super well regarded as a photographer, but uh, people noticed, and I, I had some success with that for a while. And now I'm taking it to a, a, a new step. This actually, my my first entry in this project was just released last night. I call this Project MX. And it's really less about photography and more about building a deeper human connection uh, with the people that I'm photographing. So um, the, 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 the fellow that I just interviewed, Alex Gowan, is the director of a humanitarian relief organization, The Fisherman. So he lives in a safe apartment in, in Raleigh, North Carolina in the United States. No gunfire here. Uh, but he hears that there's gunfire and shells going off in places like Ukraine or Afghanistan, uh, the Congo, and he gets on a plane and he goes there and helps children. I thought, wow, this is an incredible person. So I, I'm starting to spend time uh, getting to know those people through my eyes and then writing about them in my words. And... Uh, I, I don't know. I, th I think part of that's because as I've learned more about autism, I've, I've learned that a lot of people outside of the autistic community think that because we behave a little differently, perhaps, um, that we're not, we, we lack empathy. And I have the opposite problem. I, I'm drowning in empathy and I don't know what to do with it all. So okay. I think photography and writing has, has proven to be a good outlet for that. And hopefully allow other people to see that even, even if I'm a little odd, if I twitch and shake or maybe sometimes uh, lose the ability to speak verbally that uh, there's still a lot going on in my head and heart. Yeah. No, and, and I've seen some of your photography. Thank you. Wonderful stuff. Uh, it, Thank you. It's very art, artfully done, and, and I, I mean that with, with great sincerity. Um, I think that I can empathise with the, the some of the stuff you said. As someone that was late diagnosed with dyslexia, um, diagnosis is a it's a tricky time, but it's also a, a life changing thing, and it and it does force you to reevaluate who you are, how you interact with people, um, and. I have no regrets about my diagnosis. If anything, it's 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 been a liberating experience. Um, so uh, I, I I can absolutely uh, agree with you that it's it's something that people shouldn't be afraid of doing. Um, so I, I think you know we're of a similar age. Obviously, I've paid a hell of a lot more for illegal monkey gland injections than you. Um, <laughs> but um but uh yeah so i'm i'm also in my 40s and uh, it wasn't something that was was diagnosed that much within within my age group either you know you were certainly you had to be at the far end of the spectrum of, of dyslexia to get any kind of diagnosis you had to be right. uh, really really uh, you know doing all of the things that people classically associate like that mixing up the letters and, 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 and transposing things and, and stuff. Whereas someone uh, that had a high IQ and had a hedgehog profile would just get missed. Uh, and just, Absolutely. And, and just be sort of accused of being somewhat quirky and a bit of a dilettante and, and just a bit of a weird kid in the corner. Um, and, and, and so I think it's really you know, important that people like yourself come and talk about your experiences talk about how you know you can better interact with society, understand new ways, and, and, and show um, fantastic creativity. Because actually, I think some of my favourite creative people uh, are neurodiverse. You know, it's a fantastic amount of creativity amongst the neurodiverse population. I, I think that's that's very true. Actually, the the nature of consistently exceptional creativity. I, I don't mean like the occasional great brainstorm, but people that are able to have exceptionally creative uh, achievements uh, over a prolonged period of time, perhaps their lifetimes. 
very often these people are either neurodiverse or they have mild mental illness. And I, I, I think I've come to understand that a, a lot of that's because we perceive things differently than neuro the neurotypical population. And that allows us to synthesize ideas differently than they ever might. Um, and I, I think that's come come forward in my art. Some of my art that you've seen involved uh, women that were painted with clay, different colors of clay. And a lot of that was really came out of my realization that I'd, I'd always see, seen things. Let me back up. Neurotypical people have a habit that is odd to me of speaking in metaphors first. Uh, and when I hear them speak, I actually see the metaphor first in my brain. Yeah. And then I, ha I have to rewind and say, that's not what they meant. Okay. They, yeah. they, they meant something else. And I have to think through the metaphor. So there's this school of thought that comes up a lot in spiritual conversations and, and artistic conversations about the earth mother. And so I started seeing this literal earth mother figure in my imagination and, and realizing that through my art. Um, so, so that's where a lot of that project came from is, is just the idea that you know, people would use metaphors and not even picture in their own heads when making these metaphors, the literal interpretation of, of, of what they're saying. And that's, exactly how I'm seeing the conversation as it unfolds. Yeah. Like when you, you made a, a, a joke earlier about being injected with monkey glands and that's the first place that my brain went and I had to think that through. <laughs> yeah, no, there was a, there was a, an old story I read about a few years back where you know, the only way to keep young and beautiful was through having illegal injections from, from the glands of, of harvested from the glands of monkeys. So, um, it stuck in my head for some reason, um, and I, I, I tend to use it and it freaks people out. Um, so, um, so I'm, I'm really interested in some, in something that I know that you, you do a lot of, uh, um, and, and, and that is you work in the IT industry for your sins, um, as, as do. we all, um, but you do a lot of work around, um, teaching people about high performing teams and stuff like that. So, um, but you have an interesting take on it. So can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Um, I, I guess it would be about four years ago or so. There's this, um, real confluence of different revolutions in the IT industry that started happening, not quite at the same time, but they happen in, in lockstep, uh, one behind the other, the open source movement rose up and people started caring more about being able to see and touch and change the software that they depended on. Uh, and then the agile software development movement came up, which is a much more social way of delivering working software more rapidly. And that software is arguably more relevant and uh, more timely to the customers that are using it. And then uh, finally, this DevOps movement came up, which is where um, software developers and then the people who have to keep it running in, in production have two very different schools of thought. Software developers uh, are the innovators, the dreamers of dreams, right? And they're the ones that uh, are always releasing new features and, and, and moving the needle forward. Whereas the folks on the operations side tend to be much more conservative their mission is to keep everything running and keep yeah. it stable, stable. So all these changes are, are terrifying. They're frightening. And culturally that's built a wall between people that really ought to be uh, comrades in arms working for the same objectives. So I, I started to see the interrelationships between these three movements and it, it really resonated with me. So I, I've been out in front of that. I've been blogging about it. Uh, I used to work for Red Hat Software, uh, makers of Red Hat Linux, yeah. and, and a mm -hmm. lot of other open source products. So I did a lot of blogging for them and realized, not one, I really like the writing. Two, a lot of people seemed to really like what I was writing and asking me really powerful questions about it. 
which made me, th- those powerful questions made me think even more about what I was writing and understand it better. And, and then uh, I started getting invited to do public talks. Uh, right now, today, you're seeing me in good form. I'm not normally quite this verbally eloquent uh, <laughs> or, or able to speak much at all. So I, I, I chalk it up to the tobacco and the imaginarium. Good karma here. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but yeah, I, I've been able to get out in front of crowds and tell them a little bit more about how this all works and how to measure success, right? If you're going to make these big changes, how do you know it even did anything? And, and now more recently, I'm also starting to add in the part about consideration of neurodiversity, um, one of the things that's been a torment to me, actually, in this Agile movement is that software development has become much, much more social, uh, almost confrontational. They've removed the partitions between desks, so people are sitting, like, looking right at each other, eye to eye, which if you know many autistic people like that's uncomfortable even even right now in this video conference like i'm looking all around except at the screen that's difficult uh a lot of conversations happen now every day around the software development process and that's that's difficult too it's a challenge so i don't necessarily have the right solutions yet but i'm i'm trying to get people to think about this more because a lot of us neurodiverse people are very attracted to IT. And so even though just on autism alone, roughly one in 62 people is thought to be on the autism spectrum today, uh, I think a disproportionately large number of those people end up in the STEM fields, especially software engineering. So science, technology, engineering, and math, I think are, are all... Uh, have a magnetic draw for us. So with so many of us being present in these organizations and the software development process becoming so much more social, I I see a perfect storm brewing that is going to make it difficult for some of the most capable and some of the most creative thinkers to really thrive in an environment like that. I think I think it's really it's a really interesting area because and it's one that I've been doing a bit of work with, uh, on, um, but most of the work's been done by a former guest of ours on Access Chat, Lena, who who you'll also see on the Tuesday chat. She's doing quite a lot of work into investigating the the, the right kind of environments for people on the neurodiverse spectra um, and. Yes, it's not the open plan barn. There, there needs to be places where people can feel comfortable, uh, and I think that that the, the, the and and, and I, I I agree too that, that the amount of stimulation that you get in in these kind of environments is not conducive to, to your well being. I, I I was sat at one point um, by a corridor. Next to the uh, next to the sort of kitchen area with a bean to cup coffee machine, that for the first three hours of the day, as everyone came in, would be grinding away and screeching, um, right, driving nuts. So, so there, it does. there does need to be greater thought put into this. Yeah, I don't think that the the kind of environment that that you see with bank upon bank of, of sort of uh, Japanese restaurant style bench type desks is, is necessarily the answer and, and actually when we've been looking at refitting our, our HQ um, we've got areas where you've got wraparound chairs and wraparound sort of little cubby holes which enable you to have greater privacy in right. in, a, in an area which is otherwise open plan it's not perfect but it does it does shield you from some of that kind of um, distraction and noise and, and, sure. and all of that kind of stuff but yeah, I think you know there's more work to be done. I don't know whether you're familiar with um, the work of uh, Autitecture. Um, Another but, Access Chat regular. Yeah, so so he's 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 based in the Netherlands and he's he's um, doing a bunch of research, 
so far he's been concentrating on schools, but he's moving into the sort of workplace arena again. So he'd be definitely one yeah. to to hook up with and, and, and look into it further. Yeah, we, we definitely need it. Um, I, I, I think aside from the social challenges, another thing that a lot of us really uh, struggle with is some of the ambient environmental factors. Uh, hardwood floors are beautiful, but when people walk on them, the, the sound is very distracting. Uh, fluorescent light fixtures. Uh, a lot of us can perceive the flickering and we can hear the ballast. Uh, it, it can cause migraines, nausea. Yeah. There are certain conference rooms I just cannot go into for more than five to ten minutes at a time because of this. So, oh, the HVAC system, so the, the air conditioning, the heating, you might hear a very loud hum or hiss or the, 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 the belts of the blowers turning. For somebody like me, um, part of how I'm wired, I cannot differentiate between the background stimulation and the foreground. So you and I are having a conversation, but I'm having to focus – very hard on on your voice and i'm far too aware of the sound of the light ballasts above my head and the sight of them flickering so one of the things i have to ask my my coworkers to do as as an accommodation to me is is it okay if we can just turn the lights off for this meeting and surprisingly i i think a lot of people are okay with it once you tell them you know, this this causes me physical discomfort to have these lights on. Uh, a lot of people are very understanding of that. But if you're going to build out a new office space, I, th I think it's very important to consider with a diverse workforce, you have to take into account sensory stimulation. Uh, maybe consider LED light fixtures instead of fluorescent. You know, they're, they're much more expensive up front, but they pay for themselves in a year or two and saved energy costs. Uh, and they're much better for most of us with sensory issues. Uh, same thing if, if you're looking at the flooring, maybe consider carpeting instead of hardwood. Uh, I know it might not be as attractive or, or chic these days, but it, it really helps a lot to allow people to focus and get their, their work done. Antonio, I know you've got a couple of questions. Uh, the, the first one is related with, with the previous topic. I, I re we recently organized an hackathon at, in the Cork Airport, and m myself and, and my colleague that were organizing the event he was asking, oh, we need to put some rules together. We need to make sure that all the, all the teams are aligned and they have a certain number of people. And then we realized maybe you should you know, let that go. So and we need to wait to know who is going to be there and let see how they are going to organize themselves naturally. And in the end, we end up with people working together as a teams and the other work you know, individually or in, in one or two. So, uh, we just, okay, if we're going to put a lot of rules, some of these people, they may say, oh, I'm going out and this is not the place for me. And by giving them the space, actually, the one who won the event was actually working a team of two, or just two. So, and yes. sometimes sometime of this type of, type of events, I was looking to others that are happening. You no, know, almost this is something that happening regularly in different places. Sometimes you put too, there's too many rules around it, and people end up not uh, participating or not providing the, the value that they could provide just because there's too many rules around them. I, I agree with that. One of the, one of the things I like to promote in my talks is uh, don't be don't be so dogmatic about your rules. Uh, but be very dogmatic about your values and your principles. Decide as an organization what's important to us, what are the things that are going to guide us morally in our decision making, and write those down and stick to those. And whenever there's a disagreement, you have something to refer back to as a moral compass. And we work, you know, in, uh, we work and we, we do, uh, do a lot of studies around the, the workplace. And you were talking, Neil was talking about the workplace that we have in London, but I, I regularly read a lot of literature around the workplace, what the workplace should be. And then what I usually do, I go, you know, let's see if this person has ever done any sort of organizational transformation. You know, and I often realize there's a lot of people talking about digital transformation, talking about the modern workplace, and they work from home. 
okay, don't, they don't right. really go, they, they don't spend time in the workplace that they are talking about. And sometimes you see them leading the, the conversations or on the main blogs, on the most important blogs, the ones that are more popular. And sometimes you may see people lead or the organizations paying attention to them while they probably should be paying attention to someone else. Right. Hey, ironically, you're seeing me here at home right now, but I usually work from an open, uh, like like a bullpen or news newsroom style office space in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, when you see me on Access Chat, I am smoking my pipe, but it's outside on the rooftop. But yeah, I, I, I go into these office spaces uh, three or four days a week. I spend one or two days working from home uh, only because I, I really need that reprieve from the central or the central the the sensory overstimulation uh but but yeah i think a lot of the people making the decisions aren't the people who have to live with the outcome of those decisions yeah i i think it's going to be interesting because we've gone from having a head office where all of the um senior decision makers within the organization had their own offices to a really open environment where they have to book hot desks. Even even the even the CEO has to book a hot desk. Uh, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. I I think then there may be um, some swing back the other way because I I think that um, there is something to be said for having some some personal space. It's one of the reasons. Some place to call home. Yeah, absolutely, and and I understand the the need for flexibility. You know, we quite often, as people are traveling all over the place, you need you need hot desks. Hot desks are, there is a validity to, to the case, but not everyone should hot desk. And there are good reasons why people who are neurodiverse may not want to, and may be more productive if they don't have to. Um, you know, I I work from home now. I have to say that wasn't something that I didn't anticipated enjoying that much, but I'm much more productive because I'm, I have a space where I don't get interrupted. Um, I can have my setup um, permanently there. I'm not having to pack and unpack everything all the time. Um, the only problem is I'm twice the size of what I was a year ago because I'm only a few paces from the fridge. <laughs> I know this pain well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we're going to see this this cycle of thrashing in how office spaces are appointed uh, as, as long as we continue to pursue a one-size-fits-all approach. And there has to be a fundamental recognition, I, I believe, that we're not all the same. We don't all thrive in the same types of environments or on the same types of team structures. Sure. Sure. Uh, uh, we are diverse. We are diverse in cultural heritage. We are diverse in neurology, in mental health, uh, in physical capabilities. And I think office spaces and the cultures that surround those office spaces need to start playing it a little bit more loose and allowing different types of working environments within the same space to allow for those differences between human beings. Yeah, I, I think e-learning is almost at the same level because, you know, in the same way that we want to push, uh, you know, a standard workplace where you know, everybody should learn through e-learning, and we all learn differently. So I think there are two aspects that somehow connected in in terms of the the common approach and in the common solution for both of them. We need to give space for people to learn in a way that they are that works for them in tor instead of just providing a standard so uh, I think that there's space for, for that as well yeah I, I think it's it's one of these things where uh, you frequently see you know whenever there's a new idea there's a new paradigm everyone goes chasing off and you get these monocultures it's a monoculture of right. learning a monoculture of open plan environments um, a monoculture of you know what, every service has to shift to digital. Uh, when the actual, in actual fact, you're much more likely to have a much, a, a blended approach. Um, and, and 
that's also the, the same, you know, with with people, with the way we are. You know, we're all wired differently. You know, the, I wonder how many truly neurotypical people there are out there because we're, you know, again, it's a it's a very broad spectrum. Um, mind you, I'm surrounded by neuro atypical people, so maybe that's why. But I'm like the the Pied Piper for for neuro uh, neuro atypical people. <laughs> I, I think one of the things that I, I, I really wish would change is uh, losing the stigma around being atypical. I'm, I'm one of the very few people I know who is autistic and publicly out about it, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I do know people that I work with that are, are autistic but are not out about it. And I know people... I, I, I suspect a great number of specific people are on the spectrum and either don't know it or won't say it. Yes. And I think this discrepancy leads to a lot of misunderstanding and heartache where somebody might look at another person and say, oh, that person is such a pedantic jerk. And... They're, they're really not. They just have different mannerisms because they're on the spectrum. And precision may be more important to them. Sure. Uh, they may not be able to read between the lines. And they, you know, what comes off as being pedantic is that person just trying to make sure that they understand something correctly. Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're pretty much at the end of our half hour. It's been great chatting with you. Uh, look oh, forward, time flies. Uh, look forward to um, being on Twitter, and, and it'll fly even faster when you're when you're the guest. So um, thank you very much, Magnus. It's been great chatting. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to talking to everybody again on Access Chat. Thank you, Magnus.